I'm going to tell you this, no one has all the answers. There's no one way to get it done. Um, when I listen to the two guys previous, there's a lot of things that they do that I don't do. There's a lot of things that they are very big on that I could not do. Um, there's things that they believe that I don't believe. And that's okay. If there's anybody that gets up here at one of these conferences and says to you, this is the best way or the only way to get things done, just walk out and go to a different talk. Because within this field of strength and conditioning, there's all kinds of different ways. Within the high school age group, you know, there's all kinds of different ways. We, I mean, there's a lot of different set rep, rep schemes, there's a lot of different exercises, a lot of different things you could do to make kids strong, to make kids move, and, and be more efficient. And I heard Mickey Marotti use this um, expression, and, uh, no, actually, I'm ahead of myself. Frosty Westring, okay, a former Division III uh, football coach, wrote a, a great book, Make the Big Time Where You Are. Um, I would highly recommend it, but I think it may even be out of print. You may have to get a, a used copy. But within the field of strength and conditioning, I've seen so many people that look to other jobs as the ideal. I wish I could get there. I want to be there. I can't do this at my school. I see a lot of strength coaches at the college level that, uh, you know, they, that the mantra is, if I have not been fired, I will be fired. To me, with whatever situation you have, whatever size school you have, whatever um, amount of equipment you have, make that the big time, okay? And, and I have been in a lot of different school systems where I've gone in and sometimes we've made a weight room out of a former broom closet. You know, sometimes uh, they've got an elaborate room setting. But to me, what you've got to do is say, within the situation I've got, within the limitations that I have, how can I make this the big time? How can I work with that kid to give him everything that he is owed to him by be, me being his strength coach. This is where I'm ahead of myself. Mickey Marotti, culture versus scheme. I'm a big believer in this. I've said it for a number of years that I think it's much more important that you teach other things than just strictly work on what is my set rep scheme, um, what are the best exercises to use, um, you know, some of these type of things. I think you have to create a culture within your weight room. You have to develop something to where kids want to be in there, kids want to work hard, kids want to compete, kids look at that room as a positive means of allowing them to perform better you know, on the field, on the court, um, coaches buying into it, wanting to send the kids in there. I mean, all of those things are much more important to me than we sit down and we break down what is the best uh, number of reps to do within a set, a, num a number of sets to do within a workout and so forth. I think it's much more important that you study a lot of things that have to do with culture in the weight room versus uh, sp specifically your, your scheme. I think the ability to teach and motivate are more important than program design. If you're going to study, and if you would break it down by percentage, how much time you spend on learning motivational tools, teaching tools, how to relate to, to kids, um, self-help type things, I would say that should be a much higher percentage than you know, things that just have to do with program design. We're talking about a high school age athlete. High school age athlete is coming to you most likely where he has not done much movement. He has probably played one sport. He doesn't ride a bike. He doesn't go out and just play wiffle ball out in the field. He doesn't just do games of tag when they're younger because now that sometimes that's even outlawed places. He's coming to you with all kinds of deficiencies. What you have to do with him is get to him some general, him or her some general strength, general athleticism, general movement type skills. So to get so caught up in is this the best and you know I got this at the conference and I used that and I did all that versus the idea of how do I teach that kid? How do I motivate that kid? How do I get him to buy into making this an important part? I think you're missing, missing the, uh, the ball there. Strength and conditioning program. It's, I think it's the most important component of an athletic program. I'm going to use my school as an example because after I show you how simple I do things, you're going to say, does this guy, how can he be successful at all? When I came into my program back in 1984, our school was always the largest school in the state of Indiana. We are, were called Ben Davis, but back at that time, the nickname, and some of you have heard me speak before, we were called Band Davis because our band was very good. Seven or eight state championships, but we weren't very good athletically. We did not have a basketball team that had gotten past sectional, either girls or boys. Our football team in 47 years of football had only had 11, 500 or better seasons. Okay, so we're talking like five and five type, three, or, you know, or better, 11 within 47 years. So we've always been big. We've always been in the same place. We've always had the same, pretty much the same type of community at that time. Once we instituted a strength and conditioning program, we started the class, we did all that. Since that time, you know, we have been named, you know, one of Sports Illustrated's top 25 athletic programs in the country. Um, we've had, you know, our football team, which I gave you that example, our football team has averaged 10 wins a year for the last 30 years. 
You know, we've been eight state champions eight times. We've been national champions in football, national champions in girls basketball. We feel like the strength and conditioning program, the athletic enhancement program, has allowed us to take what we had and make them much better athletes and allows the coaches to produce out there on the field. It's not the only thing. There's all kinds of things that go into being successful. But when I go in and do consults with different schools, what I tell them is this is the thing that's going to allow you to make the greatest change in your athletic program. And I've, I've had the opportunity to go to about 40 different schools where they've paid me to come in and, you know, give my concept out to them. You know, I've got one school that's actually sent me a couple state championship rings because for the first time ever they won a couple state championships, you know, two and three years after we had been there and after they started instituting the program. So I, I really feel this strongly about this and I think you have to convince the people in your school of this. You know, that it's worth spending a little bit of money to get equipment. It's worth developing the class, you know, within the curriculum. You have to be the person that says, this is the most important thing we do. It's not the uniforms, it's not some of the facilities, it's developing athletes. When I go and talk to people, I always talk about raising expectations. I get where I go to certain schools and they'll say, well, you know, in the summer we can't lift on Friday because kids are busy and they, they uh, want a Friday, Saturday, and Sunday off, you know, or uh, we can't get kids in after school on Friday because, you know, they won't come in. Or, you know, I went to a school recently where they said, you know, in that class, we can't lift more than three days because we have to have one day where they play like dodgeball and basketball and do some things like that. You know, and then after I got done with the, the consult and I talked to them, the guy says, you know, that really hit home. We have to raise our expectations. We can't say that, you know, because the kids won't do this, we won't set the bar high. You know, I find it when I, when I put up, you know, boards up in the room. I, you know, I'm bigger on numbers than some of these guys are before, but you know, we start off with girls, 100 pound bench club, you know, just to get girls excited, set goals for themselves um, and so forth. But once I changed it from 100 to 110, because there were too many getting 100, the number at 110 was the same number I had at 100. Once I raised the bar within my weight room, whether it's clubs or, you know, anything I'm doing, the kids raised to that level. You know, I have to keep setting the bar higher. So I think it's important that you not say when you're setting up some kind of things that you say, this is as far as we can go. You know, you've got to continue to say, we can go further. And if I put this bar up there higher, the kid's going to aim higher and keep doing that. I think it's important that you understand that you get what you emphasize and you get what you tolerate. You know, I have coaches who will say, well, this is, you know, they, they look at this and they say, well, this is what's going on. Well, I say, well, it's going on because you allow it to go on. You know, I am in a district where, like I said, 80% of my kids are on free and reduced lunch. They come from a lot of broken homes. There's a, you know, a lot of poverty. There's a lot of situations there. But I can have 120 football players, okay, in front of me. With, I'm, I'm the only guy there, and I say, I need your attention. And they'll all say yes, sir, at once, and look me in the eye. Okay, these are kids that would not look at necessarily any teacher, any parent, any police officer, anybody else like that. But because I have raised that expectation, I said, this is what required of you, and this is why we're going to require it of you, they'll do it. You get what you emphasize. Um, you know, in my weight room, everybody knows that you've got to pick up. Everybody knows that if things drop, you got to do push-ups to remind you to not let things drop in the room. But it just takes care of itself. But if you emphasize things like that, you set up rules, you set up structure and so forth, kids will follow through with it. I think high school kids want discipline and structure. I found that out early. You know, when you know, I first started working with the kids, I realized that when I put things in place to where everybody was on the same, you know, they had the same rules, that other kids felt comfortable. It was like they didn't have to test me. It's kind of like, you know, in, in a classroom when you have a substitute teacher, they feel like I need to test, see how far we can go until they tell me to stop. Okay, that's where my level is. It's the same thing in coaching. You know, I think that you, you know, th they like an environment where they know everybody's got to follow the same rules. You know, the same thing applies to everyone. Uh, but, and they like structure. They like knowing where they should go and where they can't go. And they fall within that scheme, and I think it's much better. Um, I'm big on the Lombardi quote, I don't overcoach. You know, when I, when I even just hear the last two guys, I'm thinking, boy, I'm not a very good coach. Uh, there's a lot of things I don't do. You know, when Gary started talking about the amount of sleep per night, um, I could not monitor my kids' sleep per night. I mean, I could look on Twitter and see when they got off, you know? <laughs> but that's about it. You know, my kids are not, and if, if I told my kids to write down how many hours you sleep, I, you know, it ain't gonna happen. You know, if I ask them to fill out a, uh, you know, food guy, you know, type thing, what, what'd you eat? It didn't go to happen. Um, you know, my kids are getting free lunch, most of them. So they're getting what the school offers. 
I'm not going to be able to do some of these things these other people do. You know, some of the progressions he does. You know, um, I've got 35 minutes with kids. You know, I can't do some of these other things that I see all these guys do. But I feel like what I do is I work some of the things that I learned about here into my system. You know, for instance, the functional movement screen. I don't have time for the functional movement screen. I don't have time for a lot of the other screening. But I do screening when my kids are doing athletic enhancement. I do screening when my kids are doing dynamic warm-ups. I do screening when I'm watching my kids lift. You know, and I'm working on those different things. Um, you know, part of our athletic enhancement is, you know, we get down in a, you know, below parallel squat position where they're holding medicine ball, then they hold it above their head. It's within the functional movement screen, but I use it within my athletic enhancement. So I say to the kid, hey, you're leaning too much forward, you know, with your back. You've got to be able to do this. These are some things you can work on. So for me, you know, a lot of these extra things that I'm guessing some of you felt the same way as, wow, how can I do that? I mean, there's no way I can fit all that in. Uh, I don't fit all that in. Okay, but I feel like still I'm seeing my kids move more efficiently. You know, I can't break down an agility drill the way he did, does, but I do talk to kids about pushing off this leg and that leg, lowering your center of gravity, not bending over at the waist, and some of those things get incorporated into our agility drills. I feel like I accomplished what I need to accomplish. You know, he feels like he needs more. And again, that's back to there's a lot of different ways of doing this. Um, my kids move well. You know, I, I'll throw some, for you guys that like numbers, um, I mean, I use numbers as motivation. I mean, my football coach loves that we've got different things where he can tell each year. I mean, for the first 20 years that I coached there, we could, I could give a uh, pretty, you know, direct correlation between what our record is going to be based on the number of total club members we had on our team. But, you know, we're up to the point now where our football season, we've had as many as 40 guys that could squat 400 pounds. You know, over 60 guys that run a 40 under five flat. You know. I like knowing those numbers. I like challenging my teams. I like, you know, trying to do that. But, um, you know, those things happen even though I don't do some of these other uh, special things that people are talking about. Strength training class, I think, is the most important thing you can get within your program. I know some people's hands are tied, but I think you've got to keep pounding away. You've got to go to an athletic director. You've got to go to the principal. You've got to go to school board members. You've got to go to whoever it takes to say that, you know what, within every other area of, of academics, we have something for that, that student who shows an above average interest or ability in math or in science or in music or performing arts or whatever it is. Why not within physical education? And then within that, I think you need to develop it in a way to where you get it to either as an athletic class or you at least make it in a way that the non-athlete doesn't want to be in there. Okay? We do it by having a class specifically for athletes and we set up another class we call fitness and conditioning or the non-athlete who just wants to get in shape, wants to change your body composition, that type of thing, so we can adjust for their needs. So that my class, you know, and, and the way it runs at, at my school is I get the list of the 20 sports, what their rosters are, who finished the previous year, put it on a spreadsheet, give it to the counseling office and say, this, these are the kids that are allowed to be in my class and this is the period that I want them in. So, you know, we've developed that over the year, but it works out really well. I mean, I have, um, at the start of the year, a little over 400 kids within six periods. You know, so I have classes sometimes as much as 80 or 90 in them. So, you know, part of the topic was big school. There's some things that I have to do because I'm a big school, but to be honest with you, I would do them anyway, even if I were at a smaller school. But the strength training class, having kids in there both semesters, you know, for us where we attend through 12 school, all three years that my kids are in school, uh, is huge. You know, because I know regardless of what they're after school, you know, practice schedule, uh, training schedule, job schedule, whatever it is, they've gotten the, the, the basics of lifting in during that time. You don't have the ability to do a strength training class, I, you know, start something before school that's similar to a class, start something right after school, run in the same uh, vein as the class is. I think it's important that you have athletic enhancement as a part of your strength and conditioning program. You know, people talk about, and a lot of times I think just leave the, you know, the weight room part and then they think this other thing is, you know, something separate. I think it's a part of it. You know, within that class, we have a two-day upper, two-day lower lifting program, but we have a Wednesday where we do athletic enhancement. And we do it all year round. And, you know, the athletic enhancement that I do is, is very basic, okay? But I feel like it meets the basic needs of what my kids need, to, need in order to be able to move more functionally uh, and so forth. So this is a, a typical Wednesday workout. They jump up and down simu simulating jumping rope, you know, two feet, right foot, left foot, out to the side and so forth. Then we do plyometric jumps. Now, when we do jumps, my plyometric jumps don't use boxes, don't use cones. Um, I mean, I've got 80 kids in a class. You know, I can't bring all that stuff out. I don't want kids landing on boxes wrong. 
I don't want the height of the box to be wrong. I mean, I've got some kids that have a vertical jump as high as 36 inches. I have some that their vertical jump is 12 inches. You know, certain box isn't going to work for them. What I do is they jump as high as they can. When they hit the ground, they react as quickly as they can, they come off. The way I teach it is this. I say, the person who jumps the highest, runs the fastest, spends the least amount of time on the ground. We can develop that elastic re reflex within your muscle if we do maximal type jumps, where you try to hit softly, land softly, react quickly. And once you tell them that, these kids can jump as high as they can, they, you know, they, they work at it. But what I've also found is if you do that three or four times in a row, they still may be reminded why, why they're doing that. But my kids will jump high, their vertical jumps improve, you know, and we keep it really basic. So we'll do some in-place jumps. I do a lot of lunge walks. I do that as a part of my dy dynamic warm-up. But again, I'm teaching our kids how to take their hips to the ground, I'm teaching them how to bend. Uh, we do a regular lunge. We do a 45-degree lunge. We do a side lunge. All those things, I think, help in terms of, you know, ankle mobility, in terms of hip, hip flexibility, in terms of increasing range of motion. I mean, you're teaching them to be a better athlete, you know, keeping the chest up, going out, heel through the butt as they come through, keeping the back leg as straight as they can to involve the glutes. I mean, all these things are things I'll tell them when they're doing those, but I find that they move a lot better as a result of incorporating this into both our My Athletic Enhancement and My Dynamic Warm-Up. We do footwork ladders. Um, you know, we do the same ones, the same 12, 14, or whatever it is. Well, they just do one rep of each every Wednesday. And, you know, I don't want them to necessarily be footwork All-Americans, okay, where they can do 50, 60 different, you know, movements. I want them to be able to move in a zigzag pattern. I want them to be able to move sideways. I want them to be able to move backwards. So I've come up with some basic movements that I feel like cover the different ones, and we do them. And the key to me is that they do it faster. They do it with lighter on their feet. They do it. You know, that's what I'm working on as opposed to, you know, changing it up all the time. We do repeat jumps, you know, working on the same concept as the jumps in place, only they're moving forward, you know, knees up, you know, doing all that type of thing. Uh, we do medicine ball passing. I, and I do a lot of these things that I'm talking about where I try to close the gap on these movements that I can't incorporate other, other places where, you know, we'll pass the ball on one leg, you know, then the other leg. We'll pass the ball from a lunge position, you know, real low lunge position by twisting side to side. Uh, we'll work on some of these things within that, you know, one time per week athletic enhancement routine, which I see a change in their ability to do these things, where they're getting some balance and so forth, without having to break it down quite so, you know, one step, this step, second step. I mean, it's just, we put them up there and you put one leg up and, you know, you, you keep working on the kid getting better at that particular activity. Uh, we get kids in a below parallel squat, use the medicine ball as a counterbalance, and then they put it above their head and we work on that. You know, we get kids to... You know, in the beginning, as partners kind of pull back, show them where, you know, above the head is, and we work on that skill, you know, and hopefully they continue to get better at it. We show them, you know, keep the toes pointed straight ahead, keep the heels down, you know, keep the chest out, and so forth. And again, this doesn't take much time. I mean, this is incorporated into the program that you're already doing. So, you know, like I said, when I sit back there and think about all the different things that I see other people do, I, I, don't, I couldn't fit it in. But I can fit in this, and I feel like it, it accomplishes what I need to accomplish in terms of, making them less likely to get injured, you know, helping their movement skills and allowing them to, to perform better athletically. Some large school, large numbers things, okay? I, I'm big on the unified approach. Every single one of my athletes, male or female, okay, in any sport does the same routine, okay? So they have the same lifting routine, they have the same athletic enhancement routine that we have in class. I get sports specific when it comes to my preseason conditioning, off-season conditioning, extra lifts that the football team might be doing as a second lift in the day after school, their work out on the field, on practice, and so forth, that's where they get sport-specific. A high school-age athlete, especially, you know, you're working with multi-sport athletes, sh should have basic strength movements, should have basic, you know, athletic movements that they all need. And like I told you before, they're coming to you probably specializing to where you go and you make a program specific to that sport, they're still going to have these leaks that they have not filled in from the lack of movements that they had that are kind of universal. So I think it's important that they say the same. I use workout cards, okay? We don't have iPads. We don't have, uh, you know, all, all the technology that everybody else has. But I, in just a basic workout card, to me, helps me with structure. I have them color-coded. So in my class, there are five different lifts on upper body, in this side of the room, there are five different lifts on the lower body. I switch them every other day. 
the, five, the eight guys that are assigned to bench press have a yellow card. The eight guys that are assigned to another station have a different color card. You know, so I can look out and tell if people are where they're supposed to be. So it helps me with, with that. It helps me with attendance. You know, you got to take attendance in a class. Any card that's sitting there, the guy's absent. So then there's two or three guys absent. I mark it, and I don't have to you know, look around or anything like that. It helps in terms of rotating where their starting station is. Because, you know, you've got cards that are listed one, two, five but we've got everybody with a different colored car. The one starts in a different place, so the second week they start on station two. So it helps in terms of allowing me to make some variety in terms of the order of exercises that they do. And it helps them in terms of motivation. You know, I tell the kids, you know, we've got a very simple set rep scheme, but once they can get three sets, you know, if we're on three sets of 10, then they go up in weight. So the last time they'll see that they did 10 and maybe only nine, only eight. Well, next time try to get 10, 10, you know, then nine. It, it's a motivational tool if they do it right. And then it also tells them when they're able to go up. I've got to keep it simple. You know, my, kid, my average GPA on my football team is hovering right around two, okay? And that's on a four-point scale. So, you know, we're talking they're not going to be rocket scientists. You know, fortunately, we, we finally had a quarterback that went to, is going to Columbia. You know, we've got a few here and there, but the bottom end is the bottom end. So I've got to keep it simple. Uh, structure and organization, I think, is crucial, you know. Um, I think you've got to have a time clock. I think you've got to have a certain amount of time to throw out a, a specific exercise. The amount of rest has already got to have been worked into how many sets you want done within that time block and where they move to next, you know, which machine is going to be available. Um, when I see people just open rooms and they put a list of these are the exercises you need to do, go, go to it, I don't know how they can possibly get that done. Because, you know, in the summer, you know, I have these open times every once in a while. Kids don't go to the time block times. They'll do what they like doing. You know, even if you've got that card in front of them, they'll, they'll go bench, they'll go curl, you know, they'll do those things, but they won't necessarily get to all the activities you want them to. So I think structure is, is huge. Workout cards, like I said, color-coded, you know, numbered. Uh, they're filling them out. This thing lasts me in nine weeks. For an entire nine weeks, those are the cards. So I'm not doing a lot of messing. I mean, there's some people that talk about changing the percentages each week and plugging into a computer and doing all that. I don't have time for that, and really, I'd rather be spending that time developing relationships with my kids, uh, pushing them, figuring out what buttons to push, finding out what their home life is like, finding out why they're with the sport that they're with. Uh, all those things that to me are going to help me, me motivate them as opposed to me crunching numbers and pushing numbers in like that. And as far as high school kids go, when you talk about uh, down days, up days, and you, you know, you're talking about percentage, you know, my kids, there's, you know, there's a one day where maybe, you know, there's mom was getting beaten up by stepdad. You know, there's another day where they're, like, you know, boyfriend broke up with them. Another day where they failed a test. Another day where uh, mom and dad kicked them out of the house so they lived on somebody else's couch. If I programmed into it, like, would be the great cycle and so forth, I'm not going to be able to know that. But what happens naturally with my kids are the days that they feel good, they can really push themselves. The days that they have things going on, they can make that adjustment without, you know, feeling like I missed out on that specific thing that he has set up for me. And, and I'm not sure that they would follow it anyway. So, I've seen a lot of improvement with this. I mean, I did my master's thesis on my class, and I see that there's a constant improvement every nine weeks. The first year in there, you're going to get six to eight percent improvement each nine weeks on all three lifts. Um, after that first year improvement, that's without testing, you know, a pretest. That's after they've already been in my program at least three or four months before the first test. And then the second, third year, it's going to be four to six percent every time. That's going to be the average, and the range is going to be much higher. So I know that happens, even though I have not done the undulating. I have not done the uh, tier, I've not done triphasic, I've not done all those. We're basic linear per periodization. Okay, but my kids understand when they're supposed to go up in weight, when the, the set reps change, and they feel like they have a little bit of ownership in that. So, this is basically what I've got. I've got on the wall a chart. Okay, so listed are the sets of 12, sets of 10, sets of 8. So, my program is this. One week of sets of 12. For a bench squat and clean, two weeks of 10s, two weeks of 8s, two weeks of sixes, a week of six, four, two, and then we test. It's that simple. Okay, the other lifts, you know, lat pull down, some of these other ones, it's one week of 12s, four weeks of 10s, four weeks of eights. That's it, in a nutshell. Nine, every nine weeks, four, nine weeks throughout the year. And with that, my kids know that when they are, we're on tens, this is the weight I was using, so when I go to eights, this is what I should move over to. They know that when they're, you know, previous max was here, then I want to stair step down throughout the nine weeks so that my projected max is much higher. I can teach that to my lowest level kid in a very short period of time. He understands that. And like I said, we make great improvement on that. Now it doesn't 
you know, follow through with some of these textbook things that tell you, you know, you got to have more variety, you got to have more change, and so forth. But I've got 32 years of data that says it works. I feel like a high school age athlete needs to be within the 8 to 12 rep range for two thirds of the time that they're in your weight room. I don't think they need to be lifting heavy six and below for an extended period of time. I mean, I, I don't feel like that's necessary. I, I think that also leads to uh, some potential for injury. I think that uh, in terms of the guys that want to get bigger, I think they're better off at 8 to 12. But I have found that I still make great strength gains, even though I'm keeping the reps higher, um, and only three sets. You never go more than three sets in a day. That's it. I mean, the only bench twice a week, the only squat twice a week. I mean, that's the program. Time clock. If you told me that I either had to, to get rid of my time clock or six machines, okay, there wouldn't be any question. I go on with my time clock. Um, program for a seven minute countdown timer. My kids are allowed seven minutes to get three sets in. That gives me a minute and a half to two minutes rest between set. It's on the wall. Yeah, the horn blows loud enough to where they can hear it over top of the radio that's going on. And uh, so they know that when they first start, within the first couple minutes, they should have a set in. Right when it gets to about this time, they should be working on their second set. When it gets down to about a minute and a half, they should be working on their third set. You know, I'm not having to monitor each set. I know some people blow a whistle every time the set starts and so forth. It gives a little bit more ownership on them and a little bit more, you know, if they're, I set up partners based on how strong they are. But, uh, you know, every once in a while, they got to change the plates a little bit. My set and reps, I mean, it's always the same weight for all three sets, too, which kind of simplifies some things. But that clock, I think, is crucial. Before I had the clock, uh, it was a stopwatch. I used to yell, rotate. Uh, I told this story before, but you know, I got to where I broke my ankle on the way to school. I uh, wasn't in there for about a week, and uh, girls came over to my house. And this is back when they had cassette tape players. And they wanted to take a cassette of me yelling, rotate, because it just wasn't the same without me. So you, know, you get to where they're, they're, and I've told this story, too, before I like this one. I had a math teacher come in, and he goes, this is all you do? He goes, you just yell, rotate, every seven minutes? And I said, you try it. So he, uh, he, he was in there, he yelled, rotate. Not a single kid moved, didn't even flinch. Okay, then I said, rotate, and the kid just scampered. So I felt pretty good, you know. <laughs> so our high school strength and conditioning program, we've got a pretty good sized weight room. Okay, we've got 6,200 square feet. Um, but you need that when you've got 80 to even as many as 100 kids in there at a time. I started back in 1984 in the Indianapolis area. At that time, there were no other high school strength coaches. Now, within a 30-mile radius, there's at least 30. Um, my weight room was built in, in uh, this particular one was built in 2000, so it's 15 years old. There are seven to eight rooms bigger than mine within a 30-mile radius. So there's one that's uh, 11,000 square feet uh, just north of us, you know, in the more affluent area. And once they built that, the other affluent school looked at it and built one just as big. So once, you know, Geographically, I've found this to be true as I work with schools throughout the country. Once a particular school develops a strength program and they're successful, everybody else comes over and says, what are you doing? I mean, I've had 350 schools come to my school and visit our program. They, it, the ones that do well with it bring an administrator, bring a counselor, uh, bring the, the head basketball, head football coach, head, you know, the people that are pushing the buttons, and they say, why can't we do that? You know, so they go back and, you know, they implement that. But uh, if you're not there yet, and your area is not there yet, be the first. Jump in there and get that. This is my advanced weight training workout. Okay, this is what we do in the class. It's real simple, but it's the same all year. Okay, it doesn't change. Two days upper, two days lower. The starting station changes, the set reps change. But what I feel like is I want to have, you know, and they talk about movements rather than muscles, but to me they're the same thing. You're talking about pushing movements, you're also talking about chest muscles and so forth. So I'll, I'll, I'm not going to get hung up on the, the terminology. Bench press. Okay, I want a chest exercise, I want a shoulder exercise, I want a lat exercise, I want a front of the arm, I want a back of the arm, I want abs, and I want low back. So, to me, a single arm dumbbell military press, I really like a lot. Okay, kids got to tighten the core, guys go all the way up and down. I like an overhead lift in there. I mean, there's a lot of activities where they've got to put their hands above their head. I don't feel like kids have been hurt doing that. Bicep curl, you're saying, well, it's not a multi joint movement, and it's not, you know, important for particular sports. A bicep curl is dessert that you give your kid in order to get them to eat their vegetables. All right? If they're standing in front of that, and I've told this before, if you've heard me speak before, as soon as in the NFL, they start, after a big tackle, they tighten their hamstring and show everybody, I'll quit doing bicep curl. But right now, they're still doing this. Okay? So 
my kids are going to feel stronger if their arms are bigger. And it's not going to affect them negatively in any of their sports. But if that's a part of the program, they get excited about coming in here, that's fine. Okay? I, you know, I'm 57 years old and I still do bicep curl. Okay? I mean, it doesn't change. You know, it's a part of, you know, the ego of the weight room. Um, lat pull down, tricep push down, we superset so we can get a couple in. We do three different ab exercises, but that's the basic thing. So I've got a pushing movement, I've got pulling, I've got an overhead, you know, I, I've, got front, I've got the basic movements that, that any sport or any athlete in any sport, I think, needs. When it comes to lower body, I've got a squatting movement, okay? I've got, you know, we throw in the neck machine with heel raise. I know it's not the lower body, but it's one of those things that's just easier to put in there. Um, you know, with heel raise, we've also got a tibia machine, a hip machine for kids that have issues with that. We start with a hand clean, you know, two-thirds of the way, and then we'll go to the floor at the end. Uh, a single leg squat and a single leg deadlift. I'll show you how I do those in a picture, but I think those are, they, you have to have single leg movements, you have to have triple extension, you have to have squatting movements, and I've got a list of the things that I think are important, but I feel like that covers all the basics of what my athletes need in order to move better. Okay? Um, would it be nice to be able to do some different things? I think to, in some regard, yes, but in the other regard is that if every time my kid is coming in, we're doing a different lift, he doesn't know where he's been and how to motivate himself to do more. You know, if it's always that I'm throwing a new lift out to him, he doesn't know where the best, you know, amount of weight or how the movement works in order to hit the muscle group or hit the movement. And so there's constantly reteaching and there's wasted time that I could be getting him better. My kids do this and don't, I mean, they don't, like I said, they don't plateau. They don't get tired of coming in there. And there's even just a comfort to knowing this is what I got to get done today and to be excited about getting better at that particular thing. So again, it doesn't go with a textbook about you know, variety and some of those other things, but like I said, I know after 30 years that it works and it'll happen. This is how we do a single leg squat. I wanted, you know, I'm already doing squat and I'm doing cleans. We got a couple major things. We're only doing three sets, but I wanted a couple lifts that were not quite as demanding, okay, in terms of, you know, you can throw out the central nervous system, you know, fatigue, et cetera, et cetera. My kids need to be able to go out and practice on the day that they lift. My kids need to be able to compete. We lift in season on the day that they lift. So I don't want something so demanding in the weight room within those 35 minutes that they can't walk out of there. But I want something that's gonna show constant improvement. With this, they have to work on their balance, they have to work on you know, the depth there. You know, this is a kid that's not too bad at it, but kids have to get down to parallel and go up. They do one side and then they do the other. I think it's a great thing to add into there. It doesn't require any equipment. You know, we used to have, when I, that same philosophy I used to have, I used to throw in leg extension, leg curl, just because they were ones that, to me, didn't require a whole lot, but it was, I still wanted to do the squat and the clean, and you know, keep moving and so forth, but that got to be where they sit there or they nap there, you know, so I, I wanted to find something that, you know, was not a waste of time and would be beneficial, so I went to this. Um, when I teach squat, I don't have six progressions, you know, I can't do that, you know, um, I think it's great that he's able to do all of those things, but for me, if a kid can front squat with weight like this, then I know he can keep the chest up, back in, sit down over the heels. And if I feel like that kid can do that, then I move him onto a back squat. But when I move him to a back squat, we start with just the bar and then we move up. You know, we've constantly got people monitoring. I teach kids how to, how to peer coach, where they're looking at the guy, making sure he's not moving forward. I put him in a squat rack close to the front so they don't bend too far forward. I do some things, you know, that I think are important to make sure that we, you know, are safe but um, don't have as many progressions as some you know, that have talked before me. So I think within your strength and athletic program, you gotta have a squat movement. They gotta be able to squat up and down. You know, we do that with squat in the weight room, we do that with air squats when we're warming up, we do that with some of the movements we do athletic enhancement. The triple extension, you know, I, we do that with our plyometric jumps, we do that with our clean. Um, if you don't like clean, I would at least do it with maybe some dumbbells where they're jumping up, extending ankle, knee, hip. I think it's important some type of lunge movement. You know, we do it with our after school uh, football workout where we add dumbbells to it, but we also do it as a part of our dynamic warm up. We do it as a, as a part of our athletic enhancement routine that they do weekly. Single leg deadlift, if you have not done that, if you've ever had any back issues yourself, do a single leg deadlift. Um, to me, it was the greatest thing I ever picked up. I got it from Gray Cook when he was talking about, and I said, what exercise would you say is one that most people don't do that would be great to do? This was a number of years back. We started incorporating that. You know, I'm, you know, I was the kind of guy that stood at the football game after a long day in the weight room, and I'm standing out there for two hours watching our team play, my back tended to tighten up a little bit. And once I started doing these, I've had no issues at all. You know, it, it's, it's great for hamstring flexibility, it's great for, 
you know, hip, it's great for balance, um, but I would definitely do that. And something to work on ankle mobility. You know, we do that within our athletic enhancement, we do that, you know, within our lifting, but um, what I tell the kids is I said, if your ankles aren't mobile, and a lot of them wear braces all the time, so they don't really move them that well, but if your ankles aren't mobile and you go to make movements, quick, uh, demanding movements, if the ankles don't move, the next joint up is the one that takes the brunt of it, and uh, it's gonna be your knee. And so you're gonna have knee issues if you don't do that. So I think you need to make sure that you include those somehow within your program. This is a single leg deadlift. It's done different ways, but you can grab it with right arm, left arm on right leg, either way, or you can grab it with both. Um, I mean, it looks like it's touching the floor, but it's not supposed to be. You can stop right before the floor, but your body's you know, at a T-type thing and back up, so you're just kind of, you're bending over and coming back up and not putting the, the foot down. If you've never done that before, try that, okay? It may be that your hamstring's a little bit sore the next day, but you'll know that you have a weakness there that you need to improve on. You can do that with a medicine ball. You know, you can do that even just kind of as a stretching exercise. We do single leg Superman where they just get down, they put their hands up, do that same motion. But I would definitely incorporate that into your program if you don't have that. We lift in season. Now, last year uh, we won the state championship in football, 6A. It's the largest uh, um, class. We had our game on a day that was not a school day. You know, but our coach brought our team in to lift. They did an upper body lift. They always do it every Friday, but they lift, lifted on the day of the game. Okay, so they went through the same routine that they were, they were used to. You know, the other team scored 17 points on us quickly, okay, but we scored the next 42 unanswered. I don't think fatigue was a problem, okay? We have found that within all our sports. Our kids go through the same exact routine all year <laughs> round, regardless of what kind of games they have. You know, our girls that were national champions in basketball, he didn't change it at all. In fact, one time he said, let's see if we could do this. And I tried it for just one. He goes, you know, I'm never going to do that again. They came out sluggish. They didn't have that same look in their eyes. They didn't seem as confident. He says that, I don't know why I even asked you to do that. We, you know, it's about a mindset. If you and your coaches, you know, if you're the coach, tell the kids that this is a routine we're used to. If we cut back throughout the season, we're going to lose a lot of what we've gained. If we let you know you're a high school age athlete. You know, you can, you can play two or three games in AAU. You can do all these other things. Why not take a 35 minute routine where you're five stations, you know, basically about seven and a half minutes worth of work early in the day that you're used to going out and practicing hard, not thinking anything of it. Why can't you play and compete on that? In fact, our kids have gotten to where they like a little bit of a pump, you know, before the game where they feel like they've gotten something done, but they're also getting them on the same routine that they're used to. You know, it's, if they're not used to taking a complete day off, then you know, it affects their, when they go to the bathroom, it affects all kinds of other things that occur. They're not, you know, they're sluggish, they're tired. So we've been able to sell it. So it, it, within our school, nothing changes. You know, throughout the, the year, kids lift the same thing. I don't have an in-season program. I don't have an out-of-season program. They're in class. You're there to get stronger. You're there to get better. You, you know, move better. And my kids continue to improve, uh, and it hasn't affected us on the field, court, et cetera. Um, I'm very traditional, in case you haven't picked up on that. I mean, people leave here and they tell me, you know, it's, they either tell me it's refreshing or it's kind of nice to know that I don't have to do as much as I thought I had to do. I've scaled back. Things have, you know, have gone better as a result of it. Um, but tradition still works. I mean, the high school age athlete hasn't changed tremendously other than they're less active, you know. So I think as long as you incorporate some of these other things into it, I think, you know, you're going to get what you need. Things like CrossFit, you know, I'm asking, well, should my kids do CrossFit? Well, if your kids are not an athlete in anything else, but they're wanting to do something, you know, and use CrossFit as a sport, then do that. If they're an athlete and they're doing other things, I would not do that. You know, there's a lot of different things out there, you know, insanity, people throw in there and stuff like that. And I'm saying, does that really fit within what you're trying to accomplish in terms of strength, conditioning, athletic enhancement? Where, where does it fit within your program? The same with kids that go to the private sector. I know this was mentioned before, but I want the private sector people to say, okay, that kid's on a four day a week lifting program, he does two days up or two days lower, that I'm not gonna have that kid do upper on his lower day, so he's doing it three days in a row. Um, I want to be able to, you know, to feel like if that kid's gonna wanna do things above and beyond what we're doing, that it's adjusted according to what the kid is already doing. I want my kids lifting with me, because I feel like, and I, I told you I've got a whole speech on this, but. What I accomplish in the weight room in terms of team bonding, in terms of sports psychology, in terms of leadership, and, and all those things, to me, is one of the you know, greatest things we get out of that. We accomplish so much and prepare them for what they're gonna face on the field in terms of how to handle adversity, how to set goals for yourself, 
you know, how to be a good teammate and all those things within the strength and conditioning concept that uh, if a kid's out on his own at some private place, he's not getting what we need done. You can't use a college program. You know, colleges, you've got the elite athletes who've already got a base of strength, who are working with GAs and whatever to where they're one per six, and they've got constant monitoring. I would never look at a college program and say, I need to use that at the high school level. I think it's a totally different animal. I'm moving quickly because I know I'm running out of time. I do have a watch. Okay, motivation. I think it's, it's crucial. Um, I think your room has to be a motivator. You know, I've been fortunate that we've had some athletes that go on to do some great things, and people probably get tired of me throwing out names and stuff, but uh, if you watch the World Cup, you know, Women's World Cup, Lauren Holiday, uh, midfielder, it was on this, she's one of my girls, okay? But she gave me one of her jerseys, so that's hanging up there. You know, so I've got two-time gold medal winner, World Cup, there. Uh, I've got a football player that was uh, World, uh, Super Bowl champion two years ago. His jersey's there that he wore in the, in the Super Bowl. There's things like that I've got within my room. The kids see that, and it's like, wow, they went here, they did that. Anytime a kid gets on a college program, I have them send me a copy, laminate it, put it on a cabinet so people see that. Kid does something well, all Big Ten or some of these other things. Got a picture up there. Kids have come up to me. You know, how do I, you know, get up on that, on that wall? But when a kid walks into my room, he's seeing medals and so forth of previous state championships. He's seeing my 24 rings sitting out. He's seeing... You know, these people that have gone on and done great things. They're seeing top five boards where people the top five, you know, in, in weight classes. So even just walking into the room, I feel like they're motivated to set goals for themselves to, you know, try to improve. But I think if you're, you're missing out if you don't do some of those extra things. We, kids like to compete, find ways to compete. Even just, you know, coming up with things after school where it's, you know, single person tug of war on a dog rope. You know, it works. Um, using reaction balls where a reaction ball fetch, you throw four out, Last kid back, has got to do a few push-ups. They challenge each other, they race after each other. You do one-on-one -on -one type thing where the kid that misses it got to go stand in an air squat position while everybody else competes until everybody's done. Last guys that are up, they you pick which one you think is going to win. Losing team's got to do push-ups, things like that where kids love it and they forget they're doing any conditioning. Um, time sprints, you know, anytime I do sprints with teams, I've got time standards and I use them in a team format. So like I'll have the fastest in group ones, the medium in group two, slowest in group three. I blow the whistle, they take off. Last guy across the line, I blow, blow the whistle for the second guy. So once the third group finishes, I stop the watch. So it requires the entire team to do well in order to meet the time standards. And you can talk about overcoming adversity if they don't make the time. You talk about encouraging each other. You can talk about all kinds of other things that I think are really important, but you set up the time standards based on using the energy system that they use within that sport. Uh, keep data. You know, I, I, like I said, I could show coaches how well we're doing. I can give them an idea of you know, what our strength's like, what our speed's like, you know, and sometimes they've, it's affected, you know, what they've been doing in terms of, uh, you know, their schemes. Because, you know, we're not as fast as we used to be or we're not as strong as we were this year. We've got to do this. So I think that's important. Plus it shows, you know, what you can accomplish. Get assistant coaches involved, you know. Have sport coaches put attendance boards up there. You know, give results to, to coaches. Um, help with supervision. I mean, I've, I'm fortunate. I've got a football coach who's bought in so much that in the off season, when we do a second workout after school, I usually have six to seven assistant coaches along with the head football coach in with the 120 guys that I've got in there. Um, helping them motivate, helping them get to know the kids more. But I think it's important. And I think, our, you know, the, the, these sports where the coach buys in, we get the most out of them. I think you develop through peer, I mean, everybody wants to teach every single kid that comes into the room. Uh, I can't do that. I've got too many. So what I've done is I've had kids be peer coaches. I mean, I still go, go through and do a quick orientation, but then I have kids match up with other kids. I make my older kids teach the younger kids. It shows ownership. It forces them to then know the kid's name, you know, get excited about that kid when he does that 95-pound bench press. You know, it creates that atmosphere. But it also, when they have to teach something, they know it better. And then the other kid isn't afraid to ask them. There's all kinds of good things that go on when you have kids uh, peer coach. Uh, it's important that you tell kids why you're doing things. I mean, a lot of times I think we just kind of throw things out. But if kids understand why, they work much harder. Uh, I think you all need to remember you're doing strength training. You're not doing Olympic lifting. You're not doing power lifting. You're trying to make better athletes. And this is the last thing. I, I did pretty good here. Um, if you've never seen on YouTube, a guy named Rand, I think it's Randy Posh, his last lecture. It was a guy who died in, I think, pancreatic cancer. Uh, it was a professor. But if you just go Posh, last lecture on there. Um, and you want to think about life in a positive way. 
Um, the guy is unbelievable. You know, he, this is when he, know, he knew he was dying, but he wanted to give his last lecture, and he gave a lot of things that will just make you think about the things that are important to you. But one of his statements was this, brick walls are there for a reason. The brick walls are not there to keep us out. The brick walls are there to give us a chance to show how badly we want something. Because the brick walls are there to stop the people who don't want it badly enough. I use this with my kids. You know, I talk to them about the fact that, you know, you keep telling me, I can't do this because of this. Okay. I look at it as we just set a hurdle for you, figure out a way of getting over it. But I think we as coaches need to also uh, look at it that way. You know, don't tell me that your principal won't allow you to do this. Don't tell me that your AD, you know, doesn't buy into this. Don't tell me that your football coach doesn't like this or basketball coach or whatever it is. Find a way of clicking. You know, I give articles to coaches as to why we do things. You know, when new coaches come in, I go through an orientation and explain what we do. Find different ways to educate people to get them on board. It may take a while. It may take a few of their athletes excelling and then showing how they've excelled and why they've excelled. Uh, but don't let those walls kind of get in your way of doing what you can accomplish. Appreciate your attention.